Hello all, how you doing? My name is uh, Dr. Charles Capril. Uh, I gave a presentation at the IOMT meeting in Sarasota, Florida this year. Um, appears that the audio on my presentation had a little glitch. So the audiovisual people at the IOMT asked me to re-record this presentation. So here we go. Um, so I'm gonna be doing my presentation on biological extraction and zirconia implants for the everyday GP. Um, I do this every day in my practice, pretty much. Uh, we follow very strict protocols, but aside from that, it's uh, pretty straightforward and you know, you have to have some training, but it's right in the wheelhouse of any GP to be able to do. I practice in Orlando, Florida, um, and let's get started. So full disclosure, I do not have any financial interests in any of the products or procedures presented today. I'm just expressing the products and procedures I use on a daily basis in my clinical practice. And I do this daily at least, or at least every week. So my background is I graduated from the University of Puerto Rico School of Dental Medicine in 2003. I did GPR and an implant fellowship at Brookdale University Hospital in Brooklyn. And then I moved to Florida in 2006, practiced uh, corporate dentistry for about five years, and then opened up my practice in 2011, a uh, small solo practice in Orlando. Um, we started the idea of a green dental practice. So it was all about, you know, doing everything in tune with the environment. And that organically transitioned into a biological dentistry practice, especially after the mentorship of uh, Matt Young and me finding out the effects that mercury was having on myself and looking into mercury's uh, amalgam separators for the practice that weren't put in when I asked the practice to be built as green as possible. Started falling into a lot of research, made me nervous. I started seeing a lot of things that I didn't like. I started looking up uh, safe removal protocols, fell into the IOMT page, checked it out, started following Maddie Young on Facebook, started communicating back and forth, forth with him. And uh, the rest is history. Got my first machine, started doing it for myself, and eventually, you know, joined the IOMT in 2015. And, you know, the transition to biological dentistry is what prompted my change in surgical aspects. I moved away from titanium implants to the world of zirconia implants. Um, the equipment I can't practice without, uh, you definitely have to have a CBCT. I have a Serona Galileos um, ozone. What can I say about ozone? Uh, I can't, that I really can't practice without. Uh, I have a longevity generator, which I consider to be the best on the market. Uh, I took my training with uh, Dr. Malika and Harris at the ACIMD, and that is an amazing training program. You can also do ozone training with uh, Frank Schallenberger, and there's other groups, but uh, Phil Malika, you know, he will really, really let you know how to use it on a dental aspect and all the amazingness that comes from ozone and how, how, how much it's going to just improve your life as a clinician. And actually, you know, outside of it, you use it for a lot of things for yourself. So it's actually a pretty, pretty cool thing to have uh, laser. I have a photon like Walker, um, light Walker. Uh, I, I couldn't see myself uh, practicing dentistry without him either. It took me a little while to get going with it, but definitely I use it for, you know, operative. I use it for sensitivity, all of my surgical procedures are done with the laser, the laser. Uh, aesthetic procedures, night lays, you name it. And it is the greatest and most expensive crown remover in the world. Uh, PRF, I've been using PRF for a long, long, long time. Now I'm using uh, bio PRF and uh, recently took a training for the facial aesthetics with uh, Ms. Dr. Rick Miron. And that was an amazing course. I had originally done my PRF training uh, about about five years ago and I hadn't done training with, uh, with Rick and I definitely recommend, you know, taking one of his courses. Um, he knows so much and just makes it to the point where, where we can really understand his research perfectly. And then zirconia implants. Uh, I've been using Xeramex since I got into zirconia implants. I really like the two piece design. Um, you know, I, I was trained old school implantology, you know, I was always told cement, Cementing a crown on it was a big old no-no. Uh, if you if you could get away from it, so I, I really like screw down crowns. 
So the flexibility of having a two-piece implant with a, a bumpment and the bicarbo screw, which is basically a, a, a carbon fiber reinforced peak, peak screw, which I've had no issues with. I mean, restorations can sometimes be a little complicated to hold the abutment on the implant, but I can't complain. And I've also started uh, working with SDS. Um, I've done a couple, I did one case recently, and I love it too. Uh, great, uh, great uh, zirconia implants, both Ceramex and SDS. I, I, you know, they're they're a little bit different. You know, with the SDS, it's also two pieces, but it's, you know, it's a little bit of a smaller abutment. You have to cement it in, but. Um, I, I've got nothing but great stuff to say about zirconia implants. I mean, right now, titanium is gone. It's been gone in my practice for a long time, and it will never come back. So these are the, you know, the equipment that I have. On the upper left, uh, upper upper left side, you can see the uh, the lay. I call them the droids. I'm a big Star Wars nerd, so you know that's my my Sarek and my Light Walker. Uh, the longevity system there, the Galileos, and then the implant kit for for Zeramax, that's actually the P6 one because I started using the P6, now using the EXTs more than anything else. And then my two uh, PRFs, uh, centrifuges down there, one is my bio PRF, which is the one, that's my workhorse, use it all the time. But I, I had a, a process for PRF uh, Duo and I, I still use it, I still like it. You know, I prefer the horizontal centrifugation that comes with the bio PRF, but it only holds six tubes. So if I draw eight tubes, somebody's gotta go in the other one. So we can run both at the same time or even do multiple cases. So that's actually a godsend to have two centrifuges. To be honest with you, you you're gonna want, once you have one, you're gonna need a second. Uh, Pre-op considerations, um, always gonna look at the medical history. Um, you're definitely looking at the medical history, especially with uh, with uh, biological extraction protocols and, and, and um, zirconia implants, because it's very important to look at any conditions that might affect surgery, like diabetes, uh, clotting issues, osteoporosis, et cetera. Medications, you need to know what they're on. If they're on bis, uh, bisphosphonates or blood thinners or, or even turmeric, you got to remember turmeric will make a patient bleed more. Uh, and then you got smokers. Vitamins, vitamin D status, hugely important. I mean, that's probably more important than anything right now when it comes to any, anything uh, surgical using the bone and, and, um, and implantology-wise. Uh, supplementation, nutrition, you want to look into, again, there you're looking into the vitamin status, you know, patient eat, uh, what they're eating, you know, how well they're doing things and all that. Uh, periodontal status, super important. You know, again, we know that smoking, vitamin D, periodontal condition are your highest risk for failure of an implant. And then definitely doing a biocompatibility test. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> biocompatibility test to make sure that the materials are compatible with the biology of of the human that you're actually going to put them in. That's actually really, really important. Um, CBCT, uh, that's my Galileos right there. We take a CBCT on all surgical cases, uh, basically to assess the extent of the lesion in the extraction protocol, but also want to know where the inferior alveolar nerve is and the, or the sinuses. And, and I really like that warm and fuzzy feeling of knowing what I'm doing before I go on surgically. Medical history. So when, when we're talking about medical history, you know, you've got to be really careful on your uncontrolled diabetics. You know, you definitely want to know their A1C status, um, you know, see how they're doing, if they're controlled, if they're uncontrolled. They're uncontrolled and their A1C is, you know, north of seven. I would recommend putting either, either doing the bone graft. On, you know, you can do the bone graft, but it might not heal as well. Uh, but definitely the implant's going to be a big, big, big problem. The implant's going to be the biggest problem of all is you know implant healing you also want to be really on top of uh, osteoporosis and bisphosphonate therapy uh the healing is going to not be as great you're going to get inadequate healing of bone that it's not a complete contraindication but you need to make sure in your case of your biological extractions in this case you really have to close the flap completely to avoid infections or avoid any issues with uh branch which is the bisphosphonate related osteonecrosis of the jaw um, I took a pathology course a couple of years ago at UF, and it's not the bisphosphonate therapy so much that we have to worry about, but it's, it's the potential infection that can happen in that bone that you leave if you leave the socket open because it can't regenerate. You know, it's not going to break down. So you actually need to keep it secure and make sure that there's no issues with, um, with any kind of uh, infection in that area. And then you've got clotting issues. You know, you got to pay attention to patients. Uh, Vitamin K status, K1 especially, you know, 
works on 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 clotting and prolonged bleeding in past history you know and, and other things like that because you want to know if you're going to have prolonged bleeding post-op and then your smokers you know your smokers and your uncontrolled diabetics as it says right there they're going to have approximately a seven percent implant fail rate and that's you know not terrible but it's not good vitamin d hugely important to the healing of bone um vitamin d deficiency actually almost doubles the rate of failure of an implant from seven from from the bad conditions which is smokers and and periodontal patients which are at seven percent this is between 11 to 13 percent it's almost 50 percent worse uh you can test for vitamin d in your office if you would like to or you know i i tend to send patients to the lab i haven't bought a, a tester yet for my office but this test kit, the test 4D that uh, you can either, you can get through Emergen Nova with uh, Michael Foley or even from Rick Miron is a great way to be able to do testing in your office right there to check the vitamin D levels. I just basically have them go through the primary care and they've got to show me a report. You know, I want that to be 50 is what 50 and 80 is where I want the sweet spot to be. I would prefer it to be between 70 and 80. You know, 50 is going to be the least you would be okay with having. Um, I wrote on there 50 to 100. 100 is almost too much, but, it, it, you know, 70, 70 to 90, that's a great range for bone for what we want to do. Supplementation. You know, you definitely want to make sure that your patient's levels are good, but if they're not, you can always think about supplementing. Uh, patients can supplement daily, which is ideal. You know, you get them on a, on a, on a vitamin, D supplement, sorry, vitamin D supplementation daily, but if they're really lacking or they just – they, they're not doing it or they want to get the surgery done quick, you can look into a pre-op supplementation product, product like Dentamedica. Dentamedica is really good. It has literally everything you need for bone healing. It's got D, K2, boron, you name it, it's in there. You got to look at it. And they have a morning and evening formula. You're on it for a couple of days before surgery and then a couple, and then some time afterwards just to make sure that you're keeping those levels ideal to be able to heal that bone perfectly. Then you got vitamin C. If you can do an IV, you know, in your state, it's better. Again, in Florida, we can't do I vitamin D ICs. We do have IV bars that we can send them to. I do that every once in a while. But if not, liposomal vitamin C or oral vitamin C, the only problem with oral vitamin C, they got to pay attention to the potential for having loose stool. And then vitamin K, really, really important. If you're supplementing vitamin D, you need vitamin K because basically they work synergistically to work on bone levels basically it's on calcium levels so vitamin d is really important from an immuno immunological standpoint and growth of bone but vitamin k will actually direct calcium to where it needs to be correctly and actually pick up calcium when it's in places it's not supposed to be take it where it needs to be and then magnesium magnesium is super important you know if your magnesium levels are off you're not going to heal well you're not going to be healthy at all you're not going to heal well and it's really going to affect uh, bone healing for surgical extractions or for uh, implant placement. Periodontal status. Uh, for me, it's really important. I like all my implants cases to be as stable as possible prior to any implant work. If, periodont if, if periodontitis is present, it needs to be controlled. They need to go through the root plan scaling. You need to make sure and check uh, bacterial load. If the, you know, the bacterial load's too high, you can do the DNA testing of the saliva. And if, you've got, if you really have problems in antibiotic therapy to clear that up because you know as you know if you're able to clear up the periodontal condition everything's gonna be good it's gonna help it to heal you know heck the lowering your periodontal status even actually improves diabetes patients and stuff like that so you know per periodontitis is is a big problem that actually affects systemically it's a systemic problem it's not just an oral problem so we really want to make sure that we take care of it that we don't just root plan and scale but we root plan and scale and we make sure that we're getting the bone to heal, but also the bacterial uh, component needs to be taken care of. All those pathogens need to be gone. I explained the periodontal to all periodontal patients that any implant work can suffer from periimplantitis if periodontal therapy is not continued as recommended. And, you know, uncontrolled periodontitis increases the rate of implant failure 7 to 10%. Uh, to be honest with you, on an uncontrolled perio patient, I'm not putting an implant in. I'm not at all. Uh, biocompatibility test. Um, I used to use Clifford. They're closed now, but there's rumblings they're going to be back in business soon. Dr. Jaffe presented in Sarasota that they're looking to take over the business from Clifford and continue it. So we're looking forward to that. But we also have um, <clears throat> Biocomp, which is a similar test to Clifford, 
through uh, Blanche Groovy's Enterprises. And there's always the Meliza test, um, which is a, it's a, it's a test, it's an, an, it's an immune test, an immunological test of reactivity to metals mostly. So that's the kind of test that you would do to see if somebody's allergic to titanium and also to check if any of the metals that they may have in the mouth are causing problems. But it doesn't really apply directly to zirconia and plants or anything like that, but it's another good biocompatibility test to do in your office if you can. Right now it's very, very hard to do because you have to send it to Europe. So we're not able to get that done. Uh, you can always muscle test and, or do EAV, electroacupuncture, according to Vol, if it's allowed in your state. Uh, I don't muscle test, um, but that's something else that you can really look into using to see if, if it would jive with the patient or not. Uh, DNA testing. The DNA testing is great for pathogens, especially when you're taking out abscess, root canal teeth, or dealing with a cavitation. You know, you can actually send that tooth that you remove or you can, <clears throat> that abscess tooth or the, or the failing root canal, or even the, the, the gunk that's inside the cavitation, you can literally send that over to DNA Connections and they will send you a report of all of the pathogenic stuff that's in there. I mean, you start looking at that and you're kind of like, wow, you know, it's definitely what you don't want to have in the mouth, but it's a great way to explain to patients, you know, what is in there. Like right here, you can see an evaluation, a sample of a number four that I did on a patient root canal tooth and just look at all of the pathogens that were, that were in there. Uh, so my biological extraction protocol, we're going to start with that and then later on we'll go on to the implant portion of it. But so my biological extraction protocol consists of laser assisted extraction using the photon light walker. We do full surgical debridement of the socket. So we get in there, remove the tooth, remove all of the abscess tissue, all the granulation tissue, the whole PDL is, you know, we're scraping for a good while. I've got, <clears throat> I've got a, a, a nice sharp uh, curette, but I also have one that has teeth on it, which I really like. And we use that to really clean everything out of there. Once we're done with the full surgical debridement of the socket, then we're going to irrigate with ozone water. And then we're going to use ozone gas in there to basically really get in there, really clean it out, disinfect it. Ozone works on angiogenesis, so it's going to make create more vessels wanting to come in and work with my graft material. And on top of that, it increases the nitric oxide in the area, which is really, really important for healing. And this is done. Then we go through again with the light walker on the sweep setting to completely remove any, debr any, any debris that might be left in there. And then after that, I may gas a second time with ozone just because it makes me feel better. And after that, then we bring out the, the PRF, making sticky. Um, I like to use the PRF with bone. Um, so we'll use bone grafting material. I personally like using uh, human allograft, um, but you can also use synthetics. I just haven't, I haven't gotten that warm and fuzzy feeling yet from using synthetics. I've used it in, a, in the past and it's hit or miss. I've had some good cases and some less than okay cases. I had one case where, where I actually I had two sites and I did them both with uh, Augma and the site in the maxilla healed great. The, the mandible, when I went to place the implant in the, in the mandible, it was, I mean, it was mush. I, I, luckily the implant was going to obliterate the socket anyway. So I was able to scoop out all that unhealed bone graft material and got to clean, clean, clean bone again, made it bleed, got in there and even drew a little bit of PRF to put in around the implant. Um, but again, that was just one case. So I'm not a big fan of synthetic. I like using Allograph. 15 years I've been using it. You know, I have a lot of patients that don't like the idea of using it. And when it comes to that, then we can just do PRF only. Or, you know, if they, they really, really want a graft and they don't want human, then we'll look to, you know, one of the synthetics like Curasan or something like that. It works pretty well too. Um, and then after we're done, we pull out the light walker again. And this time, instead of using the Erbium YAG, like we do to, to clean out the socket, we bring out the ND YAG and we utilize it for photobiomodulation. Okay, so now we're basically using the power of the laser. The ND YAG, is, it penetrates much deeper. The Erbium YAG is just like one, la one cell layer thick right on the top. The ND YAG will actually penetrate hundreds of cells in and it's just going to boom. It's just going to wake up the... The, the cells that are healing, that are trying to heal up that area and um, <clears throat> just get the healing going, lowers the pain from later. It's just overall an amazing thing to have. 
You can utilize it in surgical areas. You can utilize it for TMJ pain. You can use it, heck, I use it for my knee. So, so photobiomodulation works really, really well in the surgical environment, in the biological extraction. So the laser assisted extraction, I use, again, the light walker. There's a setting there, you can see in the picture for the laser, and I use a cylindrical tip. It helps in vaporizing the PDL, making a trough around the tooth, which makes for easier luxation of that tooth. Most of the time, you can just eliminate that tooth by using the elevator only once you've gone through with the laser enough. Uh, it's great for atraumatic extraction, extraction with the laser, and I use the laser, the peritone, and the elevator most of the times. I do always lay a small flap because I need a place to tuck in the PRF under the gums so I can close it as well. And then sometimes if I really need to, to move, move the, the, the flap a little bit to get a little better closure. So we talk about complete surgical environment of the, uh, of the site. After you remove the tooth, you must remove the abscess cyst tissue, all the granulation tissue. The PDL must be fully removed by scraping the socket thoroughly with a sharp curette. A serrated curette is great also, which I have in my setup to remove abscesses. It, it really helps to kind of grip the whole abscess and get the whole thing out of there. And I mean, you can see that's a pretty extreme example in the picture right there. That was a pretty gnarly abscess. Um, and we cleaned it all out. We got it completely cleaned. Doesn't look like it on the picture. The suction wasn't great for the, for the photograph, but we cleaned that out completely. I mean, that was a, a really big abscess, probably about, probably about that big around. And then we use the light walker on the granulation setting, or you can even use it on the sweep setting. You get in there, clean out the rest of the granulation tissue, run the sweep setting, and it'll basically just clear out that socket completely. Ozone, like I said, during surgery, all irrigation is our ozonated water. So, you know, in the laser, if I used to have to use a handpiece drill, anything like that, the water that's going through is ozonated water. We're gonna thoroughly irrigate the socket after we remove and we debride it with ozonated water. And then we're gonna gas the socket about 60 seconds with ozone gas set at about 30 gamma. This is gonna help, again, like I mentioned earlier, debride, disinfect the socket, but also assist in the process of angiogenesis, the surgical site, to help with healing and avoiding potential cavitations. And again, nitric oxide. It's just gonna help this heal really, really well. That comes with the ozone too. And then after I'm done, I'll inject about one cc of ozone gas at 30, cc, at 30 gamma into the vestibule apical to the area just to help with healing and pain management later on. So PRF, like we were talking about, it's called, it's uh, the, the, the letter stand for platelet-rich fibrin. It was developed by uh, Joseph Chokroon, and then most of the research and development done by him and Rick Miron. So like I said, Rick, great resource to take courses and all that. We're gonna, draw, we're gonna draw the tubes. You have to be very diligent on your blood draw. They have to be in the centrifuge quickly. You got 90 seconds from the moment you started uh, pulling blood to get them in the centrifuge. If not, you actually start having a really big drop in the fibrin that you're gonna get. Um, the blood is drawn. It's put in the centrifuge really quickly. Spun in the setting to separate the fibrin from the blood without the addition of anticoagulants. This, this is a big difference between PRF and PRP. PRP is good for soft tissue, but you have to add heparin to it. And it's a lot more expensive. PRF is great. You can get liquid PRF, you can get solid PRF. I use both. I use the liquid basically for the area, but also to create sticky bone. I use the membranes to cut and add as part of my bone graft inside. Or if not, if we're just literally putting the membranes in the socket, that's what we're doing. It's a concentration of growth factors and stem cells in that fibrin clot. So you're literally going to get all of the good stuff you can get out of your blood and basically concentrate it into a fibrin clot that you're going to basically put back in. And it's going to tell that area how it needs to heal. It's going to direct the body to heal the bony defects quickly and completely and avoid cavitation. So the PRF, the venipuncture is performed on the patient blood draw. Like I said, you need to cert some states you need to certify in venipuncture, um, and you also have to check who can do it. We draw a minimum of four tubes for a single tooth. Sometimes we draw more, and then you got to put them in quickly into the centrifuge. I mentioned that before. You got 90 seconds, and then we'll make the solid plugs. We can also make you know a sticky bone by changing the tubes and the settings. Or over here, you can actually see the uh, the membranes before they've been squashed in the box, and then the PRF and graft one side of the centrifuge. 
the fibrin clots are placed in the box and they're flattened to make the membranes or they're packed to make plugs. Uh, once flattened, I will use bone grafting material. I do like to bone graft, but in patients where that don't want to, at that point, we just basically put the clots in. I'll cut up three of the clots, add it to the bone graft, mix it in also with some of the liquid PRF and get a nice sticky bone that we can literally just put in there. And then I save the last one to use a membrane after the extraction. If I'm bone grafting, like I said, I'll mix the PRF graft material together into the clean socket and fill it fully. The remaining membrane is placed over the graft, sutured in place, free of tension. Remember, tension free. If you've got tension on there, it's gonna cross, you're gonna lose the whole darn thing. And then if I'm not grafting, I'm just putting the PRF plugs or the membranes, putting them in there, again, closing the wound without tension, and it's, it's gonna heal. It's gonna stop it. You know, basically you have to remember, this is fibrin, so it's actually gonna instruct the body to clot. You're putting a clot in that's actually making a clot. So at the end of all this, very little bleeding. So here's your, you know, your bone graft. That's the site that we were looking at before in the slide about debridement. Again, I like using allograft. I'll use a cortical cancellous 50-50 mix from a company called Cellrite. I've been using them for a long time. They were a small company, literally probably about 10 minutes from my office. They got bought out by the bigger company and now they're sold by MIS. So, you know, I still get the same bone. The guy who sold me the bone originally, he's a patient in my office. I mean, I know him personally. He's shown me around. I've seen, I've seen their, their, their place. It's great. If not, you can always, always do an autograft. It's possible to use a scraper to harvest bone, but you really can't get a lot. And you can always, you know, if you really want to get involved, I don't go that route, but you can do block graft from the chin or the ramus or even the, the crest of the iliac, uh, the, the iliac crest, sorry. I stick to bottle bone. It just makes me warm and fuzzy. Um, and if you're not doing any graft, then just PRF. And there's always, you know, the option of synthetic graft, if that is, you know, your flavor. So again, we go over photobiomodulation. After we're done with the surgery, we will perform photobiomodulation. It's also known as biostim or low-level light therapy. At this point, we use the ND YAG on the light walker. You run the laser for a minute on the buccal side, a minute on the lingual side, and it just helps with healing and post-pain and a post-management pain, a pain management post-op. Sorry. And then for cavitations, I. I do a very small amount of cavitations. I'm not like Stuart, not Nanali or any of these other guys that are really getting into cavitations. I'm looking into that in the future right now. I don't really do too many. I follow the same protocol for cavitations. I do my extractions. The difference is that you actually have to access the cavitation by removing the cortical bone over it and then removing the ill healing toxic or infected tissue. Uh, sometimes there's no need to remove the cortical bone because there'll just be a, a fully unhealed socket under the gums. And, you know, you're going to clean that out, get all that gunk out of there. You know, if, you, if you've seen uh, Johann Lechner uh, lecture, I mean, it's all about rantes and, and, and the oiliness. And it's just a basically, or just, just, it's just a toxic dump pit that's in there that actually can make you really, really sick. So it is good to get rid of them. They need to, they need to come out. And you can also treat them non-surgically using ozone. I know a lot of people do ozone injections into a cavitation with an X-tip, and they talk about having really good results for that. So you, yes, you can do that. So my, my post-op for extractions, I'm gonna wait three to four months, four months being my preference before moving to the implant stage. I like to see the patient seven to 10 days. If I need to cut the sutures, I will. Then a month and then three months. I take PAs at all post-op appointments to monitor, monitor progress. And more than likely, I will repeat the CBCT prior to implant surgery. Yeah. Uh, again, I will give RX antibiotics and pain meds. I don't use narcotics anymore. I haven't for years between homeopathics and, and using the laser and ozone and everything. Pain is really not that much of a problem. But, you know, I have to write the antibiotics. I have patients that will or will not take them. But I always do write it in surgical procedures because, you know, CYA. I got an infection when I had my wisdom tooth taken out. So it's kind of one of those things. Uh, from the homeopathic remedies are also recommended to patients. We talk about Arnica for blunt trauma, Ruta for incisional pain, and Hypericum for nerve pain. You can also, you, you can follow just the single homeopathic uh, model. It's a very simple and it works at just using the actual homeopathics. Or you can do something more like a shotgun approach to homeopathy, which is something like tea relief, used to be Tramiel, now it's called tea, tea Relief. And it's just a pill, it has 
all of these homeopathics and more in one uh, in one chewable tablet that you take about every 15 minutes. Um, you've got Stella Life. It is a homeopathic uh, rinse. It's a whole kit for healing for patient. It's got it's got a gel. It's got the rinse and the rinse to replace uh, chlorhexidine. Completely homeopathic. Completely safe. It's being used by surgeons all over the world. Uh, Michael Picos loves it, only uses that. It reduces the need for any kind of pain medication. It's great. I also tell my patients to you know, put Manuka honey over the, over the healing site. I mean, Manuka honey works amazing to heal. You know, we, we, I've actually seen people heal, um, what's it called? Shingles with Manuka honey. And then we always have ozonate olive oil that we can put on the area. We can diet and care instructions, and then we go from there. So this is my first case. Um, you can actually see on here, we've got a failing root canal with a pretty massive abscess there. You know, we basically went in there following the surgical extraction protocol, utilizing the laser and everything like that. This, we've got the pre-op x-ray, we've got one at a month, and then we've got the healing at three months. You can actually see how well it's healed over. It's completely all in one case. This is post-op CBCT at three months. So in this, in his case, I actually took the, 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 the CAT scan right before placing the implant. And as you can see, healing looks amazing. This is basically what we ended up doing in the mouth. As you can see, I, I, I took both, both these pictures because the patient actually had a phrenectomy done. So we did a phrenectomy, but we also did the extraction. And there you can see it, grafted, sutured membranes over, good closure. So this is case number two. This is actually a case of a removal of an implant. Patient had a failing implant. We also eventually placed uh, an implant in number, in the site of number 14. But we're gonna be talking about, you can see the bone loss around the implant. Here you can see the PA, the amount of bone that's left. It's lost a lot, patient wanted to get rid of it. And here's the one month post-op where it's healing really, really well. There's the picture of the implant, basically uncovered. We took the crown off, it was a screw down crown, so we removed the, the crown. And then we got the picture of the implant out here with a little bit of abscess tissue that was around it. On this case, we've got another failing root canal tooth with a really gnarly little abscess. This is the picture that I showed in the earlier slides about completely cleaning out the, the abscess tissue. And as you can see, the middle picture is one month, looks really good. At three months, it really mu pretty much looks like nothing ever was there. And these are the pictures again. As you can see, there's the extraction socket. You can actually see on the left side where we were still picking out the, the abscess tissue. You can see how big it was, cleaned out, grafted. This patient, this, this, this case right here is that same exact case, three month post-op on the CAT scan and you can see the healing of bone. Nice solid bone. When you look from the top down, a nice, nice solid ridge to place an implant. So this case right here, fourth case, this is actually a, a pretty challenging case um, because of the fact that the sinus position of where it was. But if you look at the CBCT over here in the, in the bottom left corner, you can actually notice how the sinus was literally right up in between the furcation of the roots. So we had to get this one out nice and gently, but looking at it, we've got a lot of space at the palatal. Um, who knows if we have to do a sinus lift or not. If not, we'll basically place the implant more to the palate. And you can see the tooth was broken down right there. And then the extraction with the full fill. Then on this case, this was a patient of mine who I saw and you know her original pre-op with you know with the crown on there then a year later she wanted to get rid of the tooth because it had an abscess she waited a year and uh crown fell off so then we took the two ended up taking the tooth out scraping out the socket following the protocol and we ended up getting really good healing three months later now this was a, a very interesting case this patient actually waited about two years before she took that out so that's the pre-op you can see the split in the tooth in the front there on number 13 and then you can see how 15 has an abscess around it looks like it's up in the sinus but it's not so we went ahead and this is one week post-op from the removal and it looks fabulous then right here you've got a month post-op and then you got three months post-op we literally placed those implants i want to say last week i just don't have any pictures because this is the original presentation here is a picture of basically how everything, everybody came out of there. As you see, she had a bridge on top of there. 
and you can see the huge abscess cyst that was in there. We brought it all out in one piece. We were able to nucleate it completely. This case, case number seven. Now this case was a little bit more complicated. This one actually, the patient came in because she wanted to take out number 18. Sorry, it's number 19. Has an uh, infected root canal there, but also she had concerns about the ill healing area to the distal of that tooth around when she had that number 18 removed. And the report came back from the radiologist basically saying that she had ill healing bone in the back. So we actually went ahead and did cavitation surgery on her the same time that we removed the tooth. So you can see the pre-op, you can see the abscess there, one week, three months post-op. And in this case, we did both. And in these pictures, you can actually see the opening of the window of where the cavitation area was distal to the removal of the number 19. We basically laid a flap, opened it up, used the laser to cut off the cortical part of the bone up top, got in there, removed all that soft bone that was in there, a little bit of the oily stuff, and packed it just that one we actually packed in with some bone with PRF and we put a PRF membrane over it. If you look at it here, it's right before closure, you can see the membrane in place and basically came down and now you see the sutures closing it primary. Very, very happy with that case. This case right here was another one of my, one of patients that we had diagnosed a couple years ago and that's most patients, they wait, they do it later. So we had a retained root tip and the broken off fruit there. So we went ahead and basically removed both of these and grafted as well as we could. You see the healing at one month, and then you see the healing at three months that you actually lose that depression. It actually healed up really, really well. And then this case right here, this was a, a pretty challenging case. I actually got, this patient calls me up because she was swollen really bad, had cellulitis, felt really, really bad said she couldn't she couldn't uh, breathe she, she couldn't talk so i get her a little freaked out with the lug digs or anything like that i refer her to an oral surgeon the oral surgeon that's this is the panel the oral surgeon took and he proceeds to tell her to please come back and see her dentist because there's nothing wrong with 19 which we can all see on the x-ray there's a massive abscess under the family root canal but to check 18 because there was a problem you've got cervical burnout it looks like decay on eight on the distal of 18 but he was attributing this to that this was the patient when I saw her. You can see the swelling of the cellulitis area right there. And then we've got the tooth right there. I actually originally told her I was going to put her on antibiotics and see her in about three or four days once the antibiotics kicked in to take the tooth out. You can see there's no decay on 18. It's literally an abscess on 19. Patient calls me back the next day that she's an even more swollen. I told her to come into the office and that we take a shot at getting the tooth out of there. Um, as, much, as, as well as I could. I was just afraid I wouldn't be able to get her numb. So numbed her up with a, com with a combination of lidocaine and, and, uh, and no, so actually no lidocaine with her, uh, carbocaine. I was able to get her numb. We removed the tooth. We completely did the whole extraction protocol in her case with the amount of swelling and infection she had. I was not going to put bone in there. Literally, this was PRF plugs all the way, laid a full flap, blunt dissection, tried to get into the area of the, of, the, of the infection, couldn't really get much drainage, got a little bit of pus drainage, but nothing too crazy. Went ahead and put in a sterile iodophone gauze and left it there as a drain and was going to see her in a couple of days, you know, post-op to get rid of that. She calls me the next day thinking she was even farther swollen, again, just because it was a little bit more of an involved situation. I got my buddy, the oral surgeon, he saw her that same day, looked at her, Everything was fine. He said, she's healing up well. She's just tender. She's worried. Next day, he saw her remove the drain, basically called me up, sent me a text message. You know, she had, her swelling had gone down almost completely. He told me, you cured her. And this was her at her post-op uh, about three weeks, uh, uh, a month later. This is one month of healing. And if you look at the bone over there, look at that ridge. Perfectly healed over. Amazing healing. No bone. That's PRF only. So now we're gonna talk about zirconia implants. So I transitioned to zirconia implants fully in the practice about two years ago. I'm no longer using titanium implants in the practice. I mean, why? Why would we use that? I mean, titanium implants are, you know, they release titanium dioxide into the, into the bone. Most people have reactivity to the titanium. Uh, ceramics, just these zirconia implants are just great. Their biocompatibility is amazing. They are as strong as the implants, as the titanium implants we were using before. We use Aramex mostly because my preference for a two-piece screw-retained implants that are metal-free, totally metal-free. There's no metal. The, the, the screw is even a, a, um, 
um, carbon fiber reinforced uh, peak screw and it, it, it works really, really, really well. We started using SDS. I got one case running. It was a bridge. Actually, I cemented the bridge last week. So the case went really, really well. It was really simple to use. I love the fact that, that on the SDS implants, you basically put the abutment on, you have to cement the abutment on, but since it's all above the gum line, I'm not too concerned about it. And then you're gonna prep the, the, the abutment and the neck of the implant. And basically this becomes crown and bridge. So there's no crazy implant restoration or anything. It is crown and bridge at that point. So literally took an impression, sent it with the CEREC to the lab. The lab brought me, sent me back a, a, zirconia, um, a zirconia bridge and I cemented it this week and the patient is super happy. So zirconia implants, they have better biocompatibility, better soft tissue response, no release of titanium particles into the bone, no graying of the gums, and they're metal free. So there are some considerations taken to, uh, to take into mind when you're thinking about doing zirconia implants. They're similar to placing titanium surgically, but training is recommended as a lot of things are different. Certain drilling protocols are different, speeds and torque are different, you just have to be careful and you've got to tap in most cases. So it's a little bit different. It's kind of like old school titanium when you would be tapping to place the implants at the end. But overall, it works really, really well. And I mean, the tissue, Mike Foley says tissue is the issue. The tissue, it heals up beautifully. I even saw a failing SDS implant that, that came to my office because I show up as one of the SDS providers now. And if you looked at the x-ray and you looked at the tissue before touching the implant, you would say that thing is beautiful. The gums were nice and pink and healthy. The x-ray looked perfectly integrated. It wasn't until you touched the implant that it, you literally touched it, it started wiggling. So you knew it had to come out. But, you know, if that were a titanium implant, it would look like a bomb went off. So my pre-op considerations for, for zirconia implants, again, we're going to the CBCT, evaluate bone height and thickness. With implants, it's all about surface area. You know, the, the, the fatter and longer the implant, the better. If you have to have a short implant, it's got to be a real fat one. If you're going to have a, a long implant, it can be, you know, the thinnest if needed. But ideal is to have, you know, both. The more the surface area covering, the better you are. I also look at the amount of the attached gingiva and the lack of, periodon, of, of uncontrolled periodontitis. I need, if we do have a periodontal patient, it needs to be controlled. And we need to have good adequate attached gingiva around that implant. It can't just be that loose flowing thing because that will just bring nightmares. And then you want to make sure the vitamin D levels are good. If the vitamin D levels are good, fine. If not, patient needs to be on supplementation. I, patients understand this part of the informed consent. If they're not supplemented, if they're not keeping their levels where they need to be and it fails, nothing we can really do. The surgery. We sometimes do immediate placement with extraction. I tend to gravitate to, do, to delayed placement just because if, if I can let the area heal, I'd rather drill through a nice solid bone than trying to place an implant in a healing socket and then putting bone or PRF around that implant. Now, anteriors, I have done you know, my share of immediate placement. As long, but today in age of COVID, everybody's wearing a mask. You, can, you, can, you don't have too much trouble having people go with... Uh, with you know, with with doing, with with doing delayed surgery, I just I, I prefer it. I mean, it's gonna be my preference always. Depending on the case, I'll go flap or flapless. Most cases, I like to flap. I like to be able to visualize the case fully on zirconia. I did a couple, um, you know, flapless just with a tissue punch, but you know, because of the tapping, I like to be able to make sure that that taps going all the way down. It makes the cases easier and and more predictable. So I follow the, the, the drilling protocols established by the implant company and the torque levels for those implants. And again, I will rarely immediately temporize. I, aesthetic, aesthetic zone only, I will do it there any day of the week. And what we'll do is we'll make a Zarek, a Zarek crown. So if I do, like I said, we'll place an abutment and mill a crown with a Zarek as a temporary. Most cases, I will leave with a healing abutment in place and sutures to close if they're not done flapless. And like I said, today in age with masks on, most people are okay. So we do flapless versus uh, flap surgery here. I put two pictures. I happen to have one where I did a flap and then that was still an immediate placement. I removed the tooth. I laid a flap, placed the implant immediately. We put an abutment on there with a temporary crown. The patient was super happy. And then the bottom one was actually one of my first uh, Zeramex implants. 
and we did it flapless. This is when I was still doing things flapless and it worked out really, really well because I used a five millimeter biopsy punch and we were doing a, I, I want to say it was a three, three implant. So it left me with enough visualization for the tap that I was okay with that. So my post-op on implants is basically the same exact thing as for my biological extraction protocol. I'll wait three months for in preference before moving to restoration. We see the patient again, seven to 10 days, remove the sutures if needed. And then we're going to see them again at a month and at three months. We take PAs during all the appointments to monitor progress. And then we check the integration with a penguin using the ISQ. They have pins for Zeramex is another thing that I like about it. So you want your ISQ to be seven, uh, above 70 to ensure high stability. The normal range is going to be 55 to 80, but the lower numbers mean lower stability. So I always want them 70 and up. Again, the post-op for implants, exactly the same as for the biological extraction protocol. We've got the homeopathic re remedies there, the Manuka honey, the Stella Life, the tea relief for the Arnica, Rubia and Hypericum the ozonate olive oil and, and, you know, always diet and care instructions. You've got to tell these people to take care of that area. So this is first case that we have for implants. So I saw this patient originally for, for the pre-op and he had internal resorption of that and of uh, number eight. And the patient waited two years before it actually became a problem. It, it was only until it started to be vis visible that he really cared about getting rid of it. So brought them in, took that tooth out, went through our extraction of our, our biological extraction protocol. You can see right there how well the bone healed. We used a P6. This was back when I was doing a Zeramic P6. Placed the implant. Three months later, four months later, we were able to restore the implant. I, you know, we could have done a little better with a shade match. The patient was very, very happy with the way it looks. So, hey, you know, patient's in charge. I was going to send it back to the lab and change the shade a little bit. He was like, no, I want to keep my tooth. So if he's happy, I'm happy. This is the second case. This was a pretty complicated case that we ended up doing. Oh no, sorry, not this one. This is uh, actually, this is actually somebody that's walking around the IMT all the time. So, if if you see that person, say hello. And uh, we we we've got you can see in the pre-op uh, CAT scan here the space for the for the implant number four. Patient had periodontal surgery around number three. Did not want to remove it. It's pretty pretty stable, so it's good to go. Again, you can see the bone loss on the back end. Patient had an app done on there. Tooth is very stable. She's very, very happy with it. We were able to place another P6. As you can see, really well in there. A nice, I want to say that was a 12 millimeter implant and then restored it eventually with a serrat crown. Here's the abutment in place. Again, look at the tissue. You know, like Mike says, tissue is the issue. That implant, there's, it's pink and beautiful. Milled a serrat crown, put it on there. Perfect function. Patients, super happy. So this third case right here, this is an anterior case on a patient that had an abscess around the tooth, very holistic patient, did not want to deal with any root canal. She wanted the tooth pulled out. Uh, if you look at that middle, this is three months post-op, you can actually see that was a thread the needle moment right there, high pucker factor, just to make sure you get that implant put in between. I was really happy with the way it ended up. Um, this was the day we actually put the crown on. Again, we milled in the office. You can see how close that implant is to the roots of the other teeth. I mean, we literally feathered, we, we, we threaded that needle right in there. Patient was super happy. This was the day of delivery. I haven't had any post-ops. Patient moved to Colorado because she was suffering from mold issues and was told to go to Colorado, but she was super happy with her tooth. Um, this case right here is a friend of mine and uh, we had to remove the, the, the bicuspid here because of failing root canal, she was having pain, she didn't want to deal with it anymore. We took out the abscess, cleaned it out, certain biological surgical protocol, placed the P6. That one is made me really happy because we have full bicortical stabilization right there. That implant is literally stabilized by the cortex at the top and the cortex at the, at the base of the sinus. At the, at the, and it's, it's just great. We restored it, worked really well. This case right here, Another patient, that first x-ray patient brought with, um, she had an abscess again, another patient very concerned about root canals, so she wanted the tooth removed. We got her in, biological, biological extraction protocol. That's one month of the graft, that's three months of the graft on the side there. Placed the implant. This was 
placed again. This is another P6, Zeramex original implant. We'll get into the XTs pretty soon. Restored with Zarek. Actually, you got the delivery four months post-op right there. Look at the tissue. I mean, that's if if there's anything you know that, that you can that you can notice is looking at the tissue. I mean, like we go back to this case, the tissue. Tissue is the issue, like Mike says. So tissue is great. This case right here, this was uh, done recently. Again, patient wanted to, uh, he had his teeth removed. He wanted to place some implants. We had enough space. We're filing into XTs now. As you can see, we had enough space to place 12 millimeter implants if we want. We went ahead and placed two 12 millimeter uh, Zeramex XTs. You can see the difference in them. I really like them. These go a little bit more uh, bone level. Three months in, basically got it restored. Screw retained crowns, which is my preference. That's why I love this two piece system. Basically put the crowns on, check the bite. The patient wanted to whiten his teeth. So that's why we went with a lighter shade there and uh, cemented the crowns in. A little bit of Teflon in the plug, composite over the top and you're done. Patient's super happy, but again, <laughs> I delivered the crowns and the patient moved to Virginia. So hopefully I'll see him at some point to get a, um, some follow-up. This case right here, case number seven, again, failing root canal, as you can see on the bicuspid. We got in there, we removed the tooth, removed all that abscess tissue, PRF, bone graft laser, the whole biological protocol. There's a month post-op, three months post-op. This is the CAT scan uh, right before Placing the implant, you can see how we have a nice column of bone, a nice thickness down there. We went ahead and placed like that. Uh, that's a 4.2, 4.2 millimeter Zeramex. We got it in there. The angulation was a little bit off once I put the abutment. As you see, I was able to prep that abutment because you can prep the zirconia pretty well and was able to get the crown on. The patient was happy. You see the abutment there. Look at the tissue again, pretty good. It's not a great picture, I think it's zoomed in. But this other picture where you actually see the crown, I'll look at the tissue. Tissue is the issue. I'm always gonna, I'm gonna keep stealing that from Mike Foley. There's nothing there, there's no, no grain, the tissue's perfect. Now this, this patient right here had a failing bridge and basically we were gonna section the bridge, leave the crown, the tooth, remove the molar in the back because it was completely gone. You can see that in the pre-op x-ray. This is the, po the post-op CBCT before we're placing the implants. We did the, the whole biological um, extraction protocol. And then the placement of the implants, we actually did the bigger implants here. These are the five fives. We were able to get a little bit higher. That looks like it's in the sinus, but during the osteotomy, we checked that was full, clear, perfectly bone in uh, osteotomy on both. Got them really well in there then restored them with a bridge. The bridge is actually a screw down bridge. So you can see it there and we replaced the crown. So look at the tissue again, the tissue around the healing abutments and then the bridge in place. This case right here was a patient I might've been working with for a while. She actually had a failing uh, bone graft, as you can see that wasn't doing very well at all. And number eight wasn't doing, was, was needed to be removed. It was type three mobility, periodontal patient. This, this patient has been having lots of trouble with her front teeth with perio for a while, especially those two. I think she got hit in the, by, with, with somebody's head when she was younger and it actually made them loose and they never got tight. So we had to remove them. There's your one month post graft, three months post graft. In this case, we actually used the 3.5 or like Zeramex likes to call it the aesthetic implant. This is their smallest XT. We placed two. There's one month post-op, two month, uh, three months post-op, and then the delivery of the crowns that we ended up actually, you'll see in the next picture. Here's a picture of the placement of the implant. You can see how thin that ridge was. We did a little bit of ridge split and we were able to place the implants exactly where we wanted them. Again, because of the patient's periodontal condition, you can see that we ended up on the second picture on the bottom, utilizing uh, uh, pink porcelain because we had to cover the, the defect of the, of the, of the gingiva nothing we could do. She had literally lost all that bone up there to start with. So unless we went through severe GBR, which the patient did not want to do, she did not want to do any more grafting. She just wanted to get this case done and she was ecstatic with the finish. This case right here, this case I actually put in because if you look at this CAT scan, there looks like there's no bone there. The PAs looked exactly the same. 
I had a gut feeling when it came to this and I thought that I'd be able to do it no problem. And I was right. This is what the pre-op x-ray looks like. She has this, she, she was treated in Eastern Europe. As you can see, it looks like a, like a hardware, had hardware store screw back there but we were actually able to get in there, open it up and find nice solid bone. And we placed a 4.2 millimeter X, uh, XT there. It went in really well, completely tight, torqued to 45. This was the area right here when I, and I took pictures of it because it looked like there was no bone on the CBCT. It looked like there was no bone on the CAT scan, on, on the regular X-ray, but we had it. You can see the drill deep, deep into bone there. You can see the implant placed. I mean, um, again, like I said, it's my favorite quote in the world is uh, try not do or do not. There is no try by Yoda. So, you know, you got to learn what you what, what you're going to do and just kind of get going there. Um, you know, I was explaining here. He he wasn't having it. So if you guys have any questions, um, you can email me. There's my emails right there. And thank you. Uh, yes, I, I do play hockey in Florida. I, you know, it's a Puerto Rican dentist playing hockey in Florida. So tends to be one of those. But I thank you so much for your time.